I must confess to you that I'm not going to talk to you about uh, flies glued on, on sticks, uh, nor am I going to talk about moss or zebra finches. I'm going to try and in introduce you to, uh, perhaps using the terminology here, to the neurosurgical uh, observatory of the mind, uh, where we do have particular situation where a combination of observations uh, in neurosurgical setting coupled with stimulation and or recording can sometimes provide useful insights that cannot be obtained in other species or by other methodologies. And indeed, we're talking about open questions, but in this, uh, in, in this article in, in Nature, the, the idea was that uh, brain surgery, neurosurgery should really open up to really answer some open questions in neuroscience. Uh, so we'll present our modest uh, first open question, which is going to be really how do objects become mental objects? And really to borrow the ter terminology uh, of uh, uh, Schopenhauer, really representation of Vorstellung signifies the mental idea or image of any object that is experienced external to the mind. And obviously, we are not in a position to look at every one of those stations in humans, but we sometimes have clinical opportunities, and I will talk today mainly about two areas, and one really happily stands here at the top of this hierarchy, and this is really the area of the hippocampus and the neighboring structures in the medial temporal lobe. And uh, I would start with body of evidence number one, historically, and that was really the observation originally pre performed by Wilder Penfield. And um, Penfield was really in a situation in which we are to today. It is procedures which are done under local <laughs> anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see the patient Ready? here uh -huh. and the surgeon here wow. applying right. essentially stimulation to, to the surface of the brain okay. at particular sites. Now, Penfield already has seen uh, in, in, in his early ex experience that some very strange responses came out of this. And in, in short, these were very complex experiences that were brought just by really gross stimulation of particular sites. For instance, he had a patient that seemed to see herself giving birth to her baby girl. That has happened years before. Now the patient was on the operating table. Penfield, using the uh, terse scientific style said uh, this, he said, uh, was a strange moment for her to talk of that previous experience, but then I reflected women were unpredictable, and it was never intended that men should understand them completely. <laughs> Imagine what the reviewer number two would have said about that. N nevertheless, I noted the fact, that was the important thing, that it was while my stimulating electrode was applied to the left temporal lobe that this woman had had this unrelated but very vivid recollection, really, okay? And again, you know, looking at the brain, he had no clue. It all looks the same. It's a hopeless situation. But you do get very discreet and repeatable responses, which essentially, essentially gi gives you an, an experience of the patient. These are the experiential responses, they're always vivid, two of them never occurred concurrently, there is a doubling of consciousness. I have it in my mind, but I know I'm in the operating room. I am not really there, but I am experiencing that. So this is what Eulin Jackson called mental diplopia. So many patients told him that the experience brought back by the electrode was much more real than actually remembering, and yet they're still aware of the present situation. Now, Penfield came up with the idea that there is indeed a stream of consciousness within the brain, and in those areas, the interpretive areas of the temporal lobes, because that's where he was clinically, there is a key mechanism that unlocks the past. So this is body of, of evidence number one in neurosurgical setting. Now, we're gonna move to, to our, our second body of evidence, which is really going down to uh, the relevant level. I would say extremely, in an extreme fashion, the only relevant level, of course, the level of the single neuron. You know, if you look at the pyramidal cell, uh, 
I was just seeing, you know, two, two days ago in a, in a book, I didn't know, that Kahal called the pyramidal cell the psychic cell. Okay, so uh, basically we are going to look at this area, which is in information posting, is up here, of course, the medial temporal lobe. And we will try and really see what kind of transformation, what kind of transformation exists there. Now you have to remember that the medial temporal lobe is very unique in the sense that it creates representations that will be later available for conscious retrieval. And that's the key element. And the cells there will respond in such a way the neural code in the medial temporal lobe will serve this function, as I hope to show you very briefly. And, and, and just, you know, again, we are dealing with patients who are implanted with intracranial depth electrodes in order to identify an epilepsy focus. It's a particular clinical situation. The electrodes are implanted for clinical reasons, but they are very often implanted in that area of the medial temporal lobe. We do have microelectrodes, essentially microwires, uh, 40 mica, which gives us the ability to really look at single at, at single neurons, you can see here those microwires. This, uh, this is the hippocampus, and in fact here it goes into an anterior cortex, which is a primary gateway into the hippocampus. Okay, and, and we can really look at those cells, door number one, two, three. We can, you know, pull them a apart by methods of, of cell separation or cluster cutting. And essentially, you look immediately what kind, you basically will, we can show the, the patient's images for one second each and look immediately at the response. I'll very briefly present this in five minutes, this data, so I can move on. And you probably heard some of it be, be before. A lot of this work has done in collaboration with Chris Christoph and some of his uh, brilliant students. So, uh, right here you see neuron number one, and, and let's imagine that it's one of those three guys, and these are this, the spikes, okay? And this is neuron number two, very nice, neuron number three, and we go and present hundreds of those images, and something is happening with neuron number three. It sort of responds in a specific way, and indeed, what you find out that our code is a specific code, and it's sometimes very specific that out of 100 images of individuals and places, it will respond to one or two. So it really looks at the world uh, in, not in a, in a, in a uh, essentially same way. It really picks up stimuli which it responds to. So the, co the code is specific. Second, as we have already shown in 205 in this paper, it is invariant in the sense that when you start and taking this specific stimulus and now you vary it, the response does not change. That is, it will respond to all the permutation of a particular person. In this case, it's Halle Halliberry, but even to the name and even to the uh, sound, essentially, of the name itself in this cell which responds to Oprah Winfrey and responds you know, both to the voice or to, to the auditory representation and to the iconic representation and to the visual representation of the image. And these type of invariant responses are most prevalent in two structures, in the hippocampus and in the entorhinal cortex, okay? So other properties, it's a conscious code, meaning only that it responds to information which is consciously perceived. And when you, and when you do a backward masking, a, a task with various uh, durations of presentation, you can really see, as, as in this study from 2008, uh, that was done in collaboration with Rafi Malach at the Weizmann, and again by Rod Rodrigo Quiroga, his first author, and showing that those images which were recognized uh, really got responses from those medial temporal lobe cells. So conscious. Second, it's a dynamic presentation, meaning this gentleman right here, uh, you know, is the first author in, in some of those or other papers, but he's one of the experimenter. He walks into the patient room on Sunday, and on Monday there is a cell which responds to this individual invariantly. So it's, it's a dynamic rep representation. Now, it is associative, this is a study which is not finished yet by, by Matthias Eisson in, in, in our lab, where you actually show that if you have, let's say, this particular person, 
and here you have the White House, and the neuron responds to the White House and doesn't respond to this person, once you pair them together, every time you will present this image, even without any task, it will change its response, essentially. The neuron will start res responding. So there is an associative element in this coding. And finally, you, you can see you know, an example. You know, this is a, the day that, uh, that Ma Michael Jackson died. You know, we had a patient on the, the ward. Uh, yes, you know, there was the students ran, you know, and, and ran this, and of course, there was a response of a particular cell to Michael Jackson and not to a hundred other stimuli. Okay, it happened to happened to have happened also at UCLA, as you may know. So to summarize this, you know, in the seven minutes which I have already taken for, for this, I would say that the code that we see in the uh, medial temporal lobe is specific, I've shown you that. It's invariant, I've demonstrated that. Sparse, I haven't talked about that. And, and there are various com computations that can be done to really estimate the, the sparseness. But these cells, in general, the code is sparse. You know, you can find essentially a cell res responding to, uh, to one of, of 100 uh, stimuli, and then you can find you know, a certain cell in a collection of cells that we are recording for that will respond to this. You know, it is not grandmother coding, not at all, but it is sparse. And, you know, and one can, can estimate, and, and you know, one of Christa's students has done you know, a paper on this, this Stephen Wado, where you can estimate that perhaps uh, you know, one or two million neurons will participate in the coding of a mental object or a concept. And that's why we sometimes have reg regressed and call these concept cells. Uh, OK, but this is question number one. It it's, was a relatively not a very ambitious question. The more ambitious question is, how is a mental object selected for conscious representation? You know, this is the kind of question that Bergson you know, occupied himself with. And this is a, the point where he decided that he's moving out of the brain to explain that. Now, we're going to stay in the brain. But the idea, of course, is that you have some representation. And how does it really pop into your mind in the absence of any external stimulation? Okay. So yes, you have seen that with your eyes. And at some point, you will recall that. So obviously, recall, or as we very interestingly call it, free recall, OK? That is a property that would be quite difficult to study in animals. So here is an experiment, which I'll describe to you. It's 208. It's the first also is Hagar Gelbert Saksagi from the Weizmann Institute at that time, again in collaboration with Rafi uh, Malach. And the task here was really showing episodes or really video clips and, and then having an intervening task. And then the patient just has to tell you what she or he has seen. So there's no stimulus outside. The patient is locked in their own mind. Then there is an experimenter out there who wants information, obviously, but information has to come from nowhere, right? It has to pop out somehow. This is a paradigm. Well, first interesting thing is that when you present like, you know, 20 of these episodes, uh, usually centered around a certain figure, or a, or a certain animal, or a certain human, then in this case you see that there are very, very strong responses just to representation of Emma Thompson in this case. Every time she appears in a video clip of, of uh, 10 seconds, you really get very strong, sustained responses over 10 seconds. And then you present all the other, uh, or the other ones which we have used, 10 or 20 more, and there is nothing. So there's something strange here. The response is, is, is very strong, and it is obviously over and over. So you will see an example of that. That in itself is interesting, but the second part is more interesting, because in the second part, there is nothing out there. So let's just see an example of how this is done, and you just will have a few examples. So this is a single cell on the ward at UCLA. You know, there's hundreds of patients around, there's Welcome billions of neurons around. Video number one, screen. essentially, you can hear the firing. One day. This is the firing. Okay. 
Welcome to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange, the world's largest and surprisingly one of the... Hey, Dad! So the question is, is this, uh, you know, because the patient uh, remembered something new? No, well, we'll see. Does it happen the same? Is it reproducible for this particular stimulus? And uh, there are many videos in between these two, okay? interesting thing is really um, what is happening now in the period of free we recall when there is no stimulus out there, essentially. And now you see the free recall. That's a memory coming out, something about New York, right? Single cell. Okay, the cells start firing and the recollection comes and con continues to, to a certain point. And so, so, so it goes. So basically what we see essentially here, that there is really a period of, of change in firing rate, and at some point the uh, expression, the report of the recollection comes there. A and you see this, this type of thing only in the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. In fact, when you look at frontal cortex, let's say, or in other areas, paripocapal gyrus, we do see the sustained responses to particular video segments but we don't get anything when, you know, in the absence of external uh, stim stimulation. So this is the nature of the curve itself, and I want you to remember that because I'm moving you now very quickly to a different area of the nervous system. I'm moving you now uh, from the medial temporal lobe to the medial frontal lobe, okay? And I'm gonna present two bodies of evidence very quickly. Number one, um, stimulation. We have electrodes implanted, again, to identify uh, epileptic focus. We do stimulation for mapping reason. And our open question, number three, and the last question, is really how does will arise, okay? So the first thing which we have seen in 1991, we have seen it already, that when we stimulated at, at, in the area of the SMA and the pre-SMA, the patient would suddenly say, you know, I have an urge to move my hand. And those patients who were verbal enough to really express that, and that was a repeated observation which was later replicated by people in the Cleveland Clinic. So, and that was obtained really in these, in these areas in the medial uh, frontal lobe. Now, of course, that only later, really, we could bring this to the single neuron level, uh, 20 years later, really, where we actually use the Libet experiment, and you probably know about it. You have a clock here. This dot goes around in quick re revolution. The patient is instructed to do a certain task, let's say lifting a finger or pressing a button, and then, but paying attention to where the urge first came to, to do so. And Libet, you know, ha has obviously looked at the readiness potential and his insight and his stroke of genius was that he was trying to really put a, a time frame on this with respect to the point which is known as W, and that's the point where the patient tells you, uh, you know, I really uh, want to do it here. But you already see changes before that conscious realization of the will. So bringing this to, to the single neuron level in this paper, which we published uh, in, in this, this, this year in neuron, really have looked at, at many uh, sites, really, nearly a thousand neurons in these areas uh, and also in the medial te temporal lobe. And the bottom line is that you get a lot of responses which look like this, essentially. 
So cells in the SMA, in the pre-SMA, and also in the arterial cingulate will increase the firing rate about two seconds prior to W point, the point of conscious realization of the wheel, and there is another group which will decrease its firing rate. So basically, you do have, when you summarize this, you, you do have uh, groups of neurons which increase the firing rate as you approach W. You have another subset of neurons which will de decrease it, and you really see it in those regions, the pre-SMA, the SMA, and the ACC, the dorsal and the ventral part uh, of the ACC, and when you, uh, when, and also, you, what you see, you see that the number of neurons which are recruited as you approach W is increasing. So you have two processes, recruitment of more neurons, and each neuron itself is getting its activity uh, higher, or lower, depending really uh, if it is an inhibitory or excitatory uh, response. And you can look here, for instance, we looked at 37 a neuron, eight of which you, you can see here, we recorded simultaneously in a patient and you using an S, SVM classifier, we can really uh, tell, we can decode this uh, with an accuracy of 75%, 500 milliseconds prior to. And when you're looking at obviously larger po population, you are essentially getting much better results and you are seeing it in the medial frontal uh, lobe, and, but not in the medial temporal lobe. So this just brings us to the final question. I mean, obviously, this will immediately raise the sinister option of mind reading or the benevolent uh, use of thought projection in, in brain-machine interface situation. Uh, I will not talk about, about those specific experiments. I'll just show you an example how this can really come into real life. And, and this is just a study uh, which was done in, in Israel, Tel Aviv University, by, by one of the students there, Omri Peretz, to, to together with uh, Professor Yeshurun and us. And here we used intracranial EEG looking at the gamma frequency. And you will see here, essentially, you are a driver now, you are approaching an intersection and the Libet clock is inside your dashboard. So it's a, ni a nice situation and you will have to make a decision whether you want to turn left or right, okay? Uh, so you will use essentially the gamma power of the electrocorticography, you know, which is recorded at various sites and you are now approaching an intersection, you're looking at the clock, at some point you will make a decision, this classifier essentially is going to tell you here that the patient is going to turn right, okay? And what happened, eventually he gets a, a, a clue. He has to go here or press this button if he wants to turn right. And now we're going back and looking at the point where the decision time is, and this is the point of the prediction time. So it's a more sort of it's a more ecological situation where there is actually a choice. And there's a host of studies done now, it's another example, a host of studies done with F fMRI trying, of course I think with less success in terms of the decoding probability uh, to, uh, to make a prediction. Now of course it's one thing to make a, to read the mind of somebody who already has a concept in mind, but it's a totally different thing to read somebody's mind before the person himself knows what's in his or her mind. So this is really what this data really brings us to think about. And I'll just like to really end up with the general concept that, you, that the medial cortices of the brain really, really ha uh, intersect essentially at any point at the present. We are really juxtaposed, you know, bet between our memories and between our immediate action. And those are two internal generators, essentially. One is a generator for free recall. One is a generator of free will. Somehow, it's very disturbing for us to uh, have this kind of notion of perhaps a lack of free, free will, although we obviously accept the, the, the fact that we do have free re recall which is also determined prior to the realization that we're actually rec recalling. So I would just end up by saying that this type of work can only be done by dozens and dozens of people. 
uh, some of which I have mentioned. Again, I want to mention Christoph's uh, contribution to this work, as well as other people, such as uh, Rafi Malach at the Weizmann Institute and Yecheskel Yeshurun in Tel Aviv University, and many others uh, who are here. And I want to thank you for your attention.